Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are joined by the City of Cornwall Councillor Sarah Good. Located on the banks of the St. Lawrence River, the city of Cornwall, Ontario is the charming blend of historic allure and modern vibrancy. Known for its picturesque waterfronts and scenic parks, Cornwall offers a serene escape. The city boasts a rich heritage evident in its well-preserved architecture, including the iconic Cornwall Canal. As a close-knit community, Cornwall thrives on a diverse cultural scene, hosting festivals and events that celebrate its artistic spirit. The local economy is bolstered by the industries such as manufacturing and agriculture. Cornwall's friendly atmosphere and stunning landscapes make it an inviting destination for residents and visitors alike. This is Cross-Border Interviews with Councillor Sarah Good. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I, I want to start by getting to know the persona behind the counselor's name a little bit. And I start all my interviews off the exact same way. So you're no exception to the rule. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Sarah? Well, you know, I think I've always had a passion about helping people and doing the right thing. And when you look at, you know, municipal politics in particular, it is the level of politics that most directly impacts the people in the municipality. So um, I don't know that it's a duty that I feel, but I definitely felt a calling to do this. And um you know, I, I think that in conversations that I had with people over the years, it was sort of like an aptitude that I didn't really know I had. And uh, so one of the things that brought me to this was really having other people point out, hey, I think you might be good on council, like you should consider running. And now I'm here. So I'm so really enjoying it. <laughs> I, I did a little bit of a research on you. You first put your name forward in the last municipal election. So this is the first election that I can find that you put your name on the ballot, correct? That's right. Okay. So you talk about that calling. Why was the call the loudest in 2022? Because at the end of the day, people can ask you to run. Can People can tell you to run. But you, at the end of the day, have to make that final decision to say, okay, Sarah's time is now. I've got the support from people around me. I'm going to do it. What was it about that 2022 election that you said, okay, now it's time to put up or shut up? Well, so when I was approached, it was actually maybe a year or two before the last election in 2018. And at that time, I had been working, you know, contract positions. I was not freshly out of university, but I, I really hadn't had a chance to develop my career. And it, it kind of caught me by surprise. But, you know, when someone plants a seed, it, it it's hard not to let it grow. And so I, I kept ruminating on it and I started having conversations with people around me. But I really didn't feel like 2018 was the time for me. There was just a lot of instability and I felt like I had some maturing to do. Um, you know, at that time, I would have been in my late 20s and lots of people are in politics already at that point, And that's fine. But I just didn't feel like I was there. And so when 2022 was approaching, um, I had actually had my son in 2021. And so I was really fortunate well, that I was able to take an 18 month maternity leave. I'm so, so happy that that's something that's available now. Um, and so as I'm at home, you know, again, ruminating and with this tiny little baby, I, I felt like this is my year. This is the time that I'm going to be able to dedicate to this. So it it worked perfectly for me and not that being home with a baby and certainly not a toddler because I didn't really understand <laughs> how active like this is my first child so at around 13 or 14 months when he was starting to run and I was trying to do my campaigning with a toddler I had very much underestimated how challenging that would be but it was still it was still really good timing for me because I wasn't torn between two different um, responsibilities in that my day job that I was in at that time was pretty demanding and um you know lots of overtime and I just felt like oh my gosh if I'm going to be working full-time and campaigning and being a mom that's going to be really hard 
So the timing was right for me. Um, I also, I think there's like no level of preparedness that you can really have where you say, okay, all my ducks are, are lined up in a nice little row. I'm ready to go. And uh, I, I said this on council last night, actually, one of the things that my father always or often said was sometimes you just need to go ready, fire, aim. And so this was kind of a ready, fire, aim. I felt ready. I knew I had some pieces that I needed to put together and a lot of learning to do, but I also wanted to seize that window of opportunity where I knew I could really pour myself into it. And uh, I took advantage of that. You talk about the learning aspect of the job. I, I, I kind of want to sort of poke the bear, the pr proverbial bear for a second here. Prior to getting involved in municipal politics, prior to that conversation, prior to the 2018 election, had you ever considered running for municipal politics or had you ever considered even being interested in municipal politics? Because uh, it is often the one level of government that, while closest to the people, often is overlooked by the people. I think maybe in passing, not with any serious thought to it. Um, I will say that one of my colleagues on council presently, we're, we're the same age, we're both 88 babies. And so she got elected and I think she was like 26. And this is Councillor Carrie Lenny Bear, and she's wonderful, very inspirational. And so seeing someone my age doing it and being able to do it and, and being really successful and kind of pushing the envelope, I think was inspiring to me and made it feel it made it feel real and actually like something I might aspire to. Um, politics, at, I'd say like a federal level or um, a higher level is definitely something that we discussed at, at home, but municipal politics, not so much. I don't have, you know, a lot of people have politics in their blood and they've got this long line of parents and uncles and, and and whatnot who've been involved but but that wasn't the case for me and so, so are you that, the black sheep of the family a little bit by the being the first one to run into I'm, elected office <laughs> i'm the baby of the family so they just always expect me to do something that's like they're like what's her new thing that she's gonna do <laughs> they just go along with it they're used to it by this point i i, I love that um now, you have now been elected, as of recording this episode, 16 months into your first term. And I can imagine it's been a whirlwind of 16 months because you are learning the ropes, you are learning the procedures, you're learning about the issues that are affecting your city because you have an understanding. But when you actually sit around that table, you learn about the day-to-day -day issues that a city is going through. What's been the biggest eye-opening experience in the first sort of 16 months of your tenure as a counselor that you say, if I would have known this back when I first got elected, I would have been better prepared? I don't know that it's something that would have made me better prepared, but I think I had underestimated the length of time that it takes to actually implement an idea. Um, and, and now that I'm in it, I have an understanding of why things are so lengthy. There's a lot of planning that's involved. There's a lot of moving pieces, things to coordinate. And so uh, I think I had not realized the pace of municipal politics was, it's slow, you know, there's there've been motions that I put forward and we're coming up on a year and still kind of waiting to see where it's going, like waiting for reports to come back from administration. So I think the pace is something that I'm adjusting to. And now I'm kind of taking it into account. Um, you know, I, I think another part too is we're, we're 10 counselors and one mayor in our municipality. So which is a, quite a large community council, if you ask me for a city. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I come from Ontario and I know quite Ontario politics somewhat well. But when I saw that, I was like, well, that's a large council for a city of Cornwall size. We are a large council. And, you know, that's something that I've sort of started to have conversations with a few other councillors about, you know, is this an appropriate size? Do you feel like it makes for constructive meetings? Uh, we definitely have a lot of dialogue, as you saw in our budget meeting. And and I think we've got a, a fairly good diversity, like not just in our actual characteristics, but in our viewpoints and opinions. And so we have a very, I'd say, robust conversation about 
every item. The downside is it takes longer. You know, when 10 or 11 people are speaking around a table, every issue takes longer if everyone's got something to say about it. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if that ends up uh, staying at 10 or if we reduce it at some point. I want to talk about around that council table for a second, because you know, after your your time in office so far, that you have to make some pretty tough decisions around that council table. And that those decisions are going to impact every single one of your community members, good, bad, or indifferent. How do you balance that decision-making process in a community of Cornwall? Because you are the closest to the people. You are not going to Toronto to do your job. I, I would say you're not going off to Ottawa, but I'm assuming the MP might live in Cornwall and drive back and forth. I'm not 100% sure, but it is very r- relatively close at the in the grand scheme of things when you look at Ontario as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> um, How do you make those tough decisions with the information that you are provided with from administration and the feedback you hear from residents? I mean, I think you hope at the end of the day you're making the right decision. Um, And it's often not clear. Um, I'd say that administration has a better perspective of all of the background information, um, you know, I was talking about the moving pieces before they get that. And so, you know, we've got a really, we have a great administration at the city of Cornwall and I can understand and appreciate sometimes that the perspectives that I'm hearing from the community don't always align with the recommendations that are coming to us. And so I think part of it is taking in that information, listening to what they have to say, finding the pieces that are valid. And, and you know, I'm not going to agree with everyone. No one, that's just not the way it works, right? But um, I think taking into account all the information that we're receiving and, and trying to make the best decisions, you know, you want to look at every decision in the big picture. Um, everything feels immediate to people. Um, but oftentimes I say the more controversial items are ones that have the longest lifespan and that, you know, for instance, uh, in our last term, we approved a budget for an arts and culture center, which is going to be right downtown. It's going to be a black box theater with gallery space and, um, like workshop space upstairs and It's been in the works for so many years. You know, there's been countless hours put into it, volunteer hours, and and over a million dollars already raised for it. So when this came to council, uh, it had come a, a year or two prior with a much lower price tag. And I wanna say, oh gosh, I can't remember the price tag offhand. It's either 12 million or 16 million, but lot a lot of money a lot of money and so you know you get conflicting messages because there are some people that want it and some people that don't and I think it's not essential but it's something that really enhances the quality of life it enhances our tourism it really makes our city a better more desirable place to live and so you've got to you've got to weigh and balance and it is a lot of money but it's something that's going to enhance the quality of life. And there, and there are, you know, countless things like that that come up at various <laughs> price tags. And Cornwall's not a unique island in that situation either. No. Every municipality is struggling with that. Um, you talk about hearing feedback, whether it be good or against an issue or for an issue like that art center. In your time in office, are you finding that people are actually engaging with their local municipal politicians like yourself and giving their feedback on issues that are in front of council? Or are you seeing an apathy in uh, sort of what's going on at City Hall that I'm seeing across this country? I don't really see an apathy, but I do see a disconnect. Ooh, that you know okay. sometimes people are like you guys should be you guys should be implementing an organics collection and I'm like well we are and we've been discussing it for you know years now and it's mandated by the province that's so coming in 2025 but great idea you know <laughs> so people are like really upset about things that are 
happening. Um, so they're not apathetic, but I don't know that they're really doing their research and paying attention to the discussions that are taking place around the table. Uh, I put forward a motion last year that was around um, tree cutting, a tree cutting bylaw. Uh, we've got so much development and we've just seen like mass deforestation. There's, we've had such a loss in our tree canopy. And so we've got to figure it out. And people are like, what are we doing about our tree canopy? Because it's visible. You know, you drive around the community and there's just swaths of land that are now barren or, you know, especially when you see them and it's just trees knocked over and they're not even cleared yet. It, it It's very, uh, it's jarring to see. So people are like, well, what's, what is the city doing about clear cutting? And I'm like, it's happening. But again, the pace is slow. It, it, it takes a while for things to get done. So I'd say they're not apathetic. I definitely get called out on Facebook, I'd say more than anywhere else. Um, and I'm actually one to answer my phone. It's something that I know in my generation, certainly people are, they screen their calls. I just answer it and it could be spam. It could be whatever. And, uh, you know, so I've had a lot of opportunities over the last 16 months or so to have conversations over the phone with residents. And every time it happens, people are so appreciative to just get a response, um, just get to get a response, even if it's not the response that they want, really. Um, so how, so much is, how, how much is it, that, I apologize, how much is it that they, uh, it's not the response that they're looking for, but how much is it actually, they just want to be heard? Because you are the closest to the people, you will pick up your phone, you will answer those Facebook messages, I'm assuming, when people send messages to your social media accounts. How much is it that they just want to be heard by someone in an elected official position because you are the closest to the people that they're willing to even discuss these issues with you? I don't know that I could quantify it. I, I think it's a pretty big portion, um, but there's a difference between people reaching out directly, whether it be by phone or by a direct message, and or people just like writing an angry post and tagging you in it. What? And people are angry on social media, counselor? What are you talking I know, can about? You <laughs> 2024 is all sunshine and roses. They actually, it's always complimentary posts. They're like, Cornwall City Council is the best. Sarah Good is <laughs> so <local> good. Government. <laughs> Yeah, not a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, and, and I'll be honest, like I don't really want to engage in that kind of dialogue because I feel like it's so, you know, you had we had spoken right at the beginning about, you know, not cutting things so that that, you know, our discussion isn't taken out of context. And I think social media is like the absolute perfect example. And the few things that I have commented on in regards to, you know, um, something that's come up on Facebook constructively, you know, I suggest that you come and attend our next council meeting or, or come and speak to us about this issue because it, it actually is being worked on, then their comment gets deleted. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I just look like I'm talking to no one all of a sudden. So uh, I've stepped away from doing that. I realize it's not constructive and it's not a productive use of my time. But how important is it for you as an elected official to listen to all sides of this issue as well? Because while people might be angry, do they not have the right to be upset, frustrated, but, and I, I, I say this all the time when I ask this question, do it in a respectful way. If you're name calling, I have, I believe that councillors, mayors, elected officials have the right to say, until you calm down, I'm going to be over here. Calm down, we'll have a respectful conversation. Is it important to listen to all sides, even the ones who disagree with you on issues that you have voted on, whether it be a budget increase, whether it be funding for a certain project, that you say at the end of the day, you know what, I'm your elected official, you might not have voted for me because no one ever gets 100% of the votes, even those who are acclaimed never get 100% of the vote because they were acclaimed, so we would never know. How important is it to you, for you to listen to everyone, even the ones outside of that sort of social echo chamber that we find ourselves always gravitating towards? I think you nailed it on the head with the social echo chamber. It's incredibly important. And really, I almost value more hearing the perspectives of the people whose viewpoints are, are, are different than mine, because that's where you learn, right? I'm not learning new information when I'm sitting in an echo chamber. So um, I'm very open to having conversations with people uh, who have opposing viewpoints. And 
I definitely think, you know, there's, it can be done respectfully. And I have to say during the campaign, even like before being elected, I had had some really good candid conversations um, with people who I disagreed with. And I think those people actually supported me more after having those conversations because there was an honesty to it. Like they can tell I'm not placating, I'm listening. I'm open and I'm and I'm interested in in the rationale and and sort of the reasoning behind why they feel a certain way. Um, and I'm open, you know, in the sense that I, I've heard some members around council say there's nothing you can do to convince me otherwise. And I just I don't feel that way personally. Like if you actually give me a convincing and compelling reason to vote one way or another or why something is right or why something you know should be changed. I am open ears. Like I want to have all the information. I don't want to sit there with just a little piece of information and say, well, I'm right. And I'm going to be up on the top of my little hill here. Um, we're representing the people who elected us. Now, you know, that's not to say, because sometimes, you know, they talk about the, the vocal minority and the silent majority. So it, it, you got to take it all with a grain of salt, but, but I'm always into hear what people have to say. Um, you talk about the disconnect that you, you you're seeing about what people are following and the questions that you're getting, whether it be organic waste, for example. Are you finding a disconnect with issues and the jurisdictional purviews of different levels of government? During COVID-19, I think the jurisdictional lines sort of were raised at the in the entirety, and more residents are talking to all levels of government about all different levels of government's issues, healthcare, federal issues, uh, education, so on and so forth. When you are out, are you hearing people to only talk when they ask you about important topics about issues that are per uh, pertinent and in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality? I think it's natural to kind of put everything together because we are intertwined with issues that are provincial and federal. See, and even this, if it's not something that we have what, jurisdiction over, we can this, advocate. This is why I am so happy I have you on the show because you are challenging me in ways that I have not been challenged on these questions. And Lisa Post, the mayor from Orangeville, Ontario, I posted something earlier last week prior to this interview. And she said, this will be one of your good interviews. And I am <laughs> so happy that she said that because I was like, I don't know how it's going to go. Thank you. Continue. Sorry. There's my rant for that little part. Also, of the Lisa is awesome. I met Lisa at FCM, which was my very first conference. And I, we ended up at a table together. I was like, you are so cool. She was talking to me about things they were doing in their municipality, free public transit pilot, which is awesome. Uh, and then I saw her again at AMO and I was like, okay, now we're, now we're friends. <laughs> Uh, and that, that's such the such the beauty of going to those conferences. You get to connect with other uh, other municipal politicians. And sometimes you, it, it does feel kind of like you're in a bubble sometimes. So what was the question? I... It was about the jurisdictional purviews, because you, you, you yeah. say that they, they're interconnected, which they are, they are. But you know that you can't do much about health care. You can't do much about education. You can talk. You can advocate at AMO, at Roma, at uh, FCM when you go have meetings at Queen's Park or on Parliament Hill. But at the end of the day, people may ask you to help them solve issues. How hard is it for you to say, it's not in our purview, but I can try to connect you with someone who may be able to, and kind of, in some way, pass the buck to another level of government? Or do you? I mean, I think that's something that people generally, like, it hasn't been... Uh, a huge issue for me okay. in the sense that I, I I don't find that overwhelmingly people are coming to me with issues that that are really concerning other levels of government. It's not to say they aren't, but that I think there is a connection between the issues they're bringing forward. And, you know, we all, I get a little ranty sometimes, so I'm not going to pretend like I'm not one of those people, but, you know, sometimes people get on rants and they'll start to talk about how a, a certain thing should be changed. And then, and then you're like, okay, well, that it really is not something that we can do as a municipality but yeah I can connect you with the right people 
And sometimes even, you know, I have a, I have a, I'd say a good relationship with both our MP and our MPP, but I don't necessarily have a direct line to them. So yeah, I'm deferring, I'm, I'm deferring the matter to them, but in the same way at the municipality, like at the municipal level, I might defer them to, you know, our, our manager of, of infrastructure, municipal works, or I might defer them to the CAO, right? Depending on what the issue is, I'm not necessarily the expert in that, but I can make sure that I am at least attempting to put them in the right direction um i appreciate I'd your say they're pretty receptive to that that's it that that's the key thing that you just said there yeah i, I want to turn to segment two because i am cautious of time here and i want to talk about the city of cornwall as a whole but before i do this as i always do so for those who have heard this speech over and over again on this show skip forward like 15 seconds because you're about to hear the exact same thing that i've said on every single episode this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. This is not even a policy of council. The councillor I'm speaking to is one vote on a council of 11 people. That being said, councillor, in your opinion, your opinion and your opinion only, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Cornwall today as of recording this episode? I am going to sound like a broken record because I think probably everyone you've had on this show in the last, I'm going to say. I, can I guess? Years. Can I guess what it is? Is it Go housing? Ahead. Go for it. Is it housing? <laughs> it's housing. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> housing affordability. It's huge. Uh, yeah. We, like many other municipalities, have since COVID seen tent cities popping up for the very, very first time. In Cornwall, we had never had visible homelessness. And that's not to say that we haven't had homelessness, but we haven't had people visibly on the streets. And um, so it's been a real like shocker to our community. And I think people are, are rightfully feeling like, what are you doing? What are you doing to solve this? And so, gosh, if I could wave a magic wand and I could construct all kinds of social housing, I would, and we we are. But you can't, it, it's so impossible to keep up with the pace of things. And, you know, talking about different levels of government, this is not an issue that our municipality can solve single-handedly. It's a national and international issue. I don't think we're alone in it. Um, my opinion and my opinion only, I don't know, reform capitalism. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> just being silly, but. No, no, I, I, I. Uh... I will follow up though on, yeah, on this line of question because I think this is an important topic that a lot of municipalities are struggling with right now. Now you you just basically hit the ha hammer right square on the nail's head right there by saying this is not just a municipal issue. This is a federal, this is a provincial issue. Yes, even an international issue. But the municipality has its role to play. Planning, zoning. So give me a silver lining that the city of Cornwall is setting up the future of the city of Cornwall to ensure that when those developers start putting shovels in the ground, if they haven't already, the city will be prepared with infrastructure projects, with uh, uh, social programs to ensure that the growth doesn't come on the back of the people who are currently in the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a you, you just went through a budget cycle, which I'm assuming this was probably talked about not only in the open, but in closed session as well, that you have to balance the needs of the, the here and now with how you want to move your city forward. For sure. So, I mean, there's so many different aspects to it, right? One is just social housing, like our direct investment in housing as a city. Um, another, um, it was actually a decision that was made prior to me be becoming on council, um, was that we identified a few properties that had been undeveloped for a number of years that were in key locations in the city um, and designated those under a specific community improvement plan where basically they have a 90% reduction on their property taxes for 20 years years. So it's a significant cost savings in order to encourage them to build. And part of the stipulation is that in that is that they need to have a, cer a certain minimum number of affordable, which is 20% below market rate housing. Um, and so we have one that just finished construction this year, and it's literally at the main intersection of our downtown. So it's it was lit, it was an empty lot for 15 years. I think we're all really happy about that. So working on densification, there's another one that's right by we've got St. Lawrence College in our in our city. And so there's another one right across the street 
we're looking at how to increase the density of these buildings so that we're we're you know favoring infill. Uh, but we have a lot of work in terms of actually cleaning up our policies and our and our zoning. Um, we had a proposal that came to us at our last uh, planning advisory committee uh, for an 18 and 21 stout 21 story tower combined building. Um, and I'll tell you, the council chamber was full. Um, most people spoke against it because it's such a striking contrast to the the height of, of the surrounding area, but it's also on a formal industrial site that again has been vacant for a long time. And it and it it supports, you know, density, it supports public transit. They aren't specifically adding in affordable units, but just putting it on such a small footprint, um, it, it's something that I support. And I, and I, you know, you talked earlier about listening to other people's perspectives. Um, I appreciate where the perspectives come from because they're, you know, the shadow effect is real, and you know, you want something that's not going to um, feel totally out of scale and and just not fit within the city. But at the same time, currently our uh, our bylaws stipulate that I think it's a hundred feet, so roughly ten stories is the max height in the city. So we're doing a review. That was something that came up um, during our strategic planning session. Um, is how we can actually review our zoning bylaws to ensure that we're favoring, you know, densification, infill, and uh, and affordability as much as we can. Are, are, in, I know you probably don't, you, as a counselor, you don't get into the weeds of what's going on through administration, but are you hearing, are you seeing a more influx of people wanting to come and build in Cornwall than, say, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? I know you've only been on council for roughly 16 months, but uh, are you getting re reports from council saying, we are seeing a spike of people wanting to come to our city and move here because we have a quality of life that other areas in our neighborhood don't might not be able to offer. So they're looking for a place and they're willing to build here or even move here with their family. Okay, two sides to that. So we've been just shy of 50,000 for ever yeah. like as a kid it was like 46 and change and now we're at 48 and change and I think over the course of the pandemic um it really felt like we had a lot of new people who had come we have a very our, our housing is very affordable comparative to the rest of Ontario and like you know we have our own obviously I'd say we have a very high quality of life in the city and proximity to Ottawa Montreal and we're literally right on the on the border of the state so geographically it's an excellent place to be and I think we were all shocked when the census results came out and we had increased by just a very marginal percent that being said um is it because of the know. lack of availability the housing availability or are there are there houses available there there's houses available. I mean, I every year there's a new suburb that's either being built or expanded. And so, you know, that's because we're a small urban, it's been expansion out rather than up. And so I think we're kind of hitting that threshold now where that expansion is moving up. It's still moving out, but we're looking at how we can protect also our green space because we don't have much protected land other than some stuff that's been designated, uh, you know, significant, but um, we're going to have to do a lot of planning around what does our city actually look like as we're anticipating seeing this influx uh, in newcomers to our to our city. Speaking of newcomers, we have a center here that uh, is accepting um, newcomers and, and refugees. And so a lot of them have actually resettled in the community, which has really changed the diversity of our community. And I think for the better, um, you know, and we're having conversations in my professional life, I'm working in, in the healthcare sector. And so having conversations about how can we get these international credentials recognized so that you can transition people uh, into the workforce and into a sector that's really, really uh, having struggles with its human resources. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, before I turn to sort of my flip 
of that first question I just asked you. I, I, I want to sort of pose a question because you just went through budget and it's probably the ch most challenging part of being a counselor is how do you outweigh the needs of the community against the needs of the one? Because we talked earlier on in this episode, everyone believes that their issue is the most important issue to them. But you know, after just going two days <laughs> through a few days of council, budget deliberations, that you have a limited supply of money. You cannot please 100% of the people out there, but they believe their issue is important. We need more services at this library. We need a better uh, uh, sidewalk in this area of town because my children walk on it back and forth to school, so on and so forth. Very individual micro issues. Housing is a very macro issue that the, the city is moving forward with. How do you, have, as a counselor, balance what the community, the individual resident wants with the individual community as a whole wants? You know, I'd say that at this time, we don't have an excellent mechanism for just receiving those individual wants. And so what we went through as part of this budget deliberation on Monday, we had a town hall and it was open to both organizations and individuals who wanted to make a plea, whether that's for funding for a program, whether it's just to ask for, there were some, some in-kind requests and some to say, you know, focus on the environment and improving, you know, sustainability to achieve net zero, which is one of our strategic priorities. Um, I don't know that those individual asks have really come out on the surface as much as you'd think like they're not competing they're, it's not to say they're not competing but it, it's not as prevalent um I'd say the real struggle for us and especially in this budget was um was some of the uh nonprofits who were looking for support from us to to keep them afloat and, you know, you're talking bigger picture versus individual. Well, some people might think, oh, well, I don't use that service, so it's not for me. But what is the impact of that service on our community and especially on our most vulnerable? Are there other services that could replace it or that could, you know, provide an alternative to what they're trying to offer? And so we ended up investing in a number of outside agencies because they provided services to the community that otherwise don't exist. Um, and so I think, you know, generally as a council, we were on the same page about that. It, it's tough. We, we were not able to cut anything out of the budget this year it came to us and it was just it was so tight already that what do you you're gonna cut row like there there are projects you can't cut and you know that if you're doing it you're just making a problem for yourself next year or the <laughs> over the next several years so um no I appreciate that answer yeah. because I now want to flip the script a little bit because okay. I got accused in 2023 and I, I'm going to hold her against this because every time I say this, she knows who I'm talking about. Um, I got accused that I only talk about negative things when it comes to the community oh, as a whole. That. I know. So I'm going to flip the script a little bit and say, what do you boast about? So you just boasted about Orangeville's free public transit system that they are piloting in Orangeville. And that is at the uh, request of council. What do you do when you go to Roma, AMO, FCM, and you boast to other municipal leaders about what's going on from an administration and a municipal standpoint about what they're doing right? So what administration is doing right? Or the or the, the town as a whole. Like what hmm. does, what, what program is the thing that you boast about or what service is the one that you talk about the most when you say to other municipalities, you know what, you're doing it okay. Cornwell's doing it better. Gosh. Um, I'd say we have some really good recreational uh, assets within the community. Um, we've got a multi-sports center with several hockey rinks at the Benson Center. We've got our civic complex that is an event center, um, and that's located in Lamoureux Park, uh, which is a massive, massive open green space. We have tons of events that take place in the city, uh, and definitely, you know, before COVID, every single weekend there is something going on in the park. I think from an administration perspective, um, 
we've had a lot of change since I've come on to council. So when I, when we were sworn in, it was announced to us that our CAO was leaving and moving to the surrounding counties. So we spent the next several months with an interim CAO going through a recruitment process. And we were really lucky. Um, I, I, I'm very happy with our new CAO, uh, Mathieu Fleury. Uh, he was a previous counselor for the city of Ottawa for three terms. Very, very intelligent. Um, he's got great innovative ideas. And so he started in at the end of August, and I, I think everyone is noticing a transformation. And you know, it's tough because I wouldn't go to another. I wouldn't go to Roma and be like, "Oh, our CAO is so great." But at the same time, I think it impacts it impacts how everyone works and how everyone feels. And I think they're at least from the outside, not the outside, but I'm not working in City Hall every day, yeah. right? So when I when I show up. Um, I feel there's a different energy there. And I think having that stability now of, of a new CAO and having um, some of the previous policies that maybe, you know, were a little outdated or hadn't been reviewed in a long time, there's now this big review that's taking place. So I think we're going to be a lot more efficient. Um, but in terms of just like assets that the city has, you know, our our public transit is good. I don't know that I would that I would boast about it. I think what we've recognized is that we need to make a lot of improvements. I think our social housing is good, but we're still seeing a lot of homelessness. I think our recreational programs are are really good, but we could still see improvements. So um I'd say for me, my draw to Cornwall is that it has it's like a small town in a city that's got all the amenities you need. And what I can, my quality of life is enhanced so much by the fact that I'm not drowning in a massive million dollar mortgage. And when we have friends in Ottawa and Montreal, I, I'm like, how do you even live? I, I it, it's, it's hard to comprehend when you're living in the city that, you know, your housing actually takes up a reasonable portion of your, of your income. And so for me, that is that was a motivating factor to to move here. I live right downtown Cornwall. I'm like, I'm I'm right downtown. And so I walk everywhere. I walk to council every time. Um, our downtown closes on Sundays, and that's kind of sad, but it's beautiful. And now that you know we're all sort of coming out of the covers of COVID, I think you, is, there's a reawakening that's happening in our, in our city and, and it's, and it's energizing. It feels really good. So I want to turn to the last segment here because I'm cautious of time and we're almost at the 45 minute mark. So hopefully you have an extra few minutes for me here at counselor. Uh, I want to talk about my favorite subject and that is tourism, because I have made a pledge that if you come on this show, I come to your community. So I'm coming to you Cornwall later on in 2024 when I do a swing through Eastern Ontario. So I've got to know besides having a coffee with the best uh, counselor named Sarah good on city Cornwall's uh, council, what should I take in? What are some of the hidden treasures of Cornwall that you don't think gets uh, a, a, enough attention when it comes to tourism to your great community? Yeah, for sure. So I would say uh, if you're coming in the winter, you've got to check out Big Ben. This was a previous landfill that was converted into a ski snowboard hill. And it's such a unique thing for a municipality of our size to have. And such a great way to actually use something that would otherwise just be an old closed landfill. So Big Ben is awesome. Uh, it's family run. Uh, it's very inexpensive and you can even rent or borrow equipment there, which is a, a really cool thing that they do. Uh, Altsville Theatre as well. There's lots of programming that's going on there. It, it varies. Uh, it varies all the time. So it's not like there's one particular show, but uh, Seaway Valley Theatre Company often will often will use their space and they've got their own space as well. So there's there's live theatre. We've got Klein House Gallery. Uh, it's an art gallery. The, the exhibition changes monthly. They have art classes classes as well that are actually uh their art classes are run through the city which is pretty cool <clears throat> and check out our beautiful waterfront um it's underdeveloped and I think that's kind of part of what makes it feel really nice is you've got this urban space that's adjacent to this wide open park um yeah those are some of the things that I would say to check out 
And although it won't be there for you in 2024, um, we're currently in the process of working out a deal with Great Wolf Lodge. And that is going to be like an enormous tourist draw for us. So I think everyone in the community is... I haven't heard anyone say they're not excited about Great Wolf Lodge. It's it's a big big thing for us and I think it's going to it's going to boost everyone at the same time. Where do you go in town? Where do you go in the city to just decompress after a long day of council meetings, after just with everything that you have going on in your life? Is there a spot in the community that you can go recenter yourself knowing that tomorrow you're going to have to make some tough decisions again possibly? Okay, I wish I went out more, but like I have a toddler, so I don't. <laughs> so I home say, it is. All right, no, no, no. <laughs> I am cool. I probably no. <laughs> um, I think in Cornwall, it's actually the place that I that I met my partner is Schnitzel's, which is one of our downtown restaurants, and it is like the Cheers of Cornwall. There are lots of amazing restaurants: uh, Esca, Edwards Bistro, Choro, Casa Polo. We've got tons. Like we have really, really good restaurants in Cornwall. But Schnitzel's is just a few blocks from my house, and like I said, it's the Cheers of Cornwall. You go in, and everybody knows your name, and it's so cozy. You know, nice bank on the bar side so that's definitely a spot that I would go I'm also right next to the library and we've got a beautiful library too that uh there's yeah the library is right in our downtown and it, it's a beautiful spot so I'm glad that we have have that but I'm I'm definitely one to to hang out at the bar side at Schnitzel's <laughs> I can't wait to visit Schnitzel's yeah. in Cornwall <laughs> in 2024 <laughs> my last question for you counselor before I have to let you go and we started talking about you you were ending by talking about Cornwall and it's the million dollar question that I think every municipal politician knows how to answer. I just like to get it on the record. What makes Cornwall such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Cornwall's a really supportive community. It's got a small town feel with big town amenities and we're close to everything. We're also bilingual, um, on a un très fort uh, francophonie ici à Cornwall and um, I just think it's such a beautiful place to be and you can live here without breaking the bank so you can enjoy all of the tourist activities that we have um, yeah Sarah yes. Lisa did not disappoint when she said this was going to be a great <laughs> interview this has been a wonderful interview and I'm so honored that you took time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me for 45 minutes to talk about yourself, municipal politics, which is my favorite thing to talk about, but also the city of Cornwall as a whole. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for serving. I don't think you guys hear that enough. Thank you so much for putting your name forward and stepping up and making a difference in your community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been a real pleasure. I'm, I'm really happy that you invited me on here. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all of our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just Keep talking.